Wave your hands at God and tell Him thank you. Thank you, God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. Remain standing with me, if you would please, in honor to God's Word. We're going to two portions of Scripture tonight. We're going to the book of Nahum, chapter 1, the prophet Nahum. By the way, it's good for you to learn about your books of the Bible, because your life will go to heaven one day, and the prophet Nahum's going to ask, did you read my book? And you're going to go, was that in the Bible? <laughs> In the book of Nahum, chapter 1, we're going to listen to the words of the prophet as he is going to explain. And also, you're going to need to get to Proverbs, chapter 13. Proverbs, chapter 13. We'll immediately be going there right afterwards to Proverbs, chapter 13. But chapter 1, Nahum, verse 3 and verse 7. I need to speak to you tonight in a prophetic tense of past, present, and future. That we can understand the things that God desires. Verse 3, the Lord is slow to anger. Now, I don't know what makes you shout. <laughs> but when I think of what the Lord could have been angry with with me, but he was slow to anger. <laughs> Come on, somebody lift your hand and say, that's why I live. That's why I'm still alive, because he's slow to anger. Some of, us, some of us need to learn that too. You need to be a little slow to anger. And great in power, and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm. The Lord's going to have his way with storms. And the clouds are the dust of his feet. Verse 7, the Lord is good. <laughs> Woo. Hey, it's not just a saying, friend. It's Bible. The Lord is good. He's a stronghold in the day of trouble. See, having his way in the storm also means he's a stronghold in the day of trouble. And he knoweth them that trust in him. Proverbs chapter 13 verse 12 Proverbs chapter 13 verse 12 would you read this out loud with me hope deferred maketh the heart sick but when the desire cometh one more time hope deferred maketh the heart but when the desire cometh hope is an earnest expectation for change something you're hoping for it doesn't happen the Bible says, not Sigmund Freud, but the Bible says it'll make your heart sick. Yet we're told the Lord's going to have his way in the storm. I want to deal with you tonight on this subject, the storm of disappointment. The storm of disappointment. As you set your Bibles down and you lift your heart, your hands and your heart unto the Lord. Father, we need you to speak to us. We need you to open up our minds, open up our spirits, open up our understanding. Help us, help us to be doers of this word. Help us, oh God, by your grace, speak a clear, profound word that we may receive and may walk in light of the word of the Lord. We thank you for the performance of it. Whew. Ah. Glory. Glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Before you're seated, would you shake hands with someone and just say, I'm so glad you're here tonight. Is gracious enough to let us know the things that are transpiring if we will talk and listen to him. I told you on last night that as in the month of 
August, I was in England and I woke one morning and the Lord began to speak to me about the change in the seasons that were yet to come. And he said, from the first week of, from the beginning of September to the end of the year would be a season of storms. Well, I watched immediately as he, because he'd also said this, it will be natural and spiritual storms. The first week in September, Bermuda had its worst storm in over 50 years. And the Lord spoke to me and he said, this is an indication of the season that you've just entered into. It's going to be hard hit. He said, the storms are blowing, would be blowing in three areas of our lives. He said, they would blow in the area of finances, they would blow in the areas of relationships, and they would blow in the areas of our physical body. He said, the reason why he would allow these storms, well, before I get into why he allowed it, he said, the purpose of the devil in in the midst of these storms is to cause a spirit of fear and that through the spirit of fear he then would be able to control us how many know the fearful are the first ones going to the lake of fire if you don't believe that you can look at revelations 21 verse 8 that was revelations 21 and 8 and then he said the reason why he's allowing it is for dependency the greater the dependency, the more power God can release through you. And so God has allowed storms to blow that will not allow us to stand of our own accord. You won't be able to intellectualize it. You won't be able to figure it out. You won't be able to work it out. You won't be able to rely on your gifts and your talents to fix it. It'll be beyond you so that you know you have need of God. Somebody say, I have need of God. The Lord then spoke again as we were in the midst of the season. As I began to come into the month of November, the Lord spoke again and said, Son, things are getting ready to intensify. From the middle of November to the end of this year, storms will intensify, both naturally and spiritually. And as you saw as we hit December, of course, you know, I know Cincinnati normally gets a lot of snow, but my goodness, I felt like God just took a box of snow and dumped it on New England and said, here, this is for you. Happy holidays. As 36 inches of snow fell, cars were buried. I was talking back to my sisters and said, you couldn't even see the car. You didn't know a car was there. So much snow, storms. Flu has broken out to almost an epic proportion storms these things are indications of what is happening they are a reflection of what is happening in the supernatural realm this is why there's storms and then God said one of the major storms that is blowing particularly in our head is the storm of disappointment the devil is seeking to disappoint us or to cause us to feel disappointed and let me explain why. The word disappointment, if we will break it apart, the first word is dis. Dis means to take, like discourage means to take courage. The second word is appointment. Appointment means a place or a position. When you're disappointed, you are being taken out of your place or out of your position. Now, when you are out of your place and out of your position, you are not positioned to be blessed. So if he can cause you to become disappointed, whether with yourself, with God, or with others, then this causes you not to be aligned with the flow of God that can come into your life. It causes you to become weary in well-doing. And what am I trying for, by the way? The proverb said, hope deferred, an earnest expectation for change. I was expecting something to happen. It didn't happen. And the Bible says, it makes your heart sick. Now, he said, when the desire comes, it's a tree of life. It's powerful when it happens. But when it doesn't happen... It leaves you in a broken condition. When you were thinking in yourself that things would work out differently than the way they've worked out, that by now I would be out of certain things, finances would be better, I'd have more friends, things would be more established, my marriage would be better. And in case you haven't noticed, when God talked about the storm blowing in relationships, that's why so many marriages, even amongst God's people, are at the brinks of divorce. 
Let me tell you something about a storm in case you don't know. Storms cause damage. They cause losses. And this is a season where losses are happening. Losses are transpiring, whether it be people dying that you love, whether it being jobs losing, whether it's finances. Losses are transpiring in the midst of this season. And God's making clear that material things cannot be your satisfaction and friendships and relationships cannot be your security. Somebody lift your hands and say, God is. God has to become all of those things unto you. Now, there were two things that God gave us to tell us to survive the season of the storm. God told me to get into it tonight. Number one is the fear of the Lord. Oh, I'm going to talk about this one tonight. The fear of the Lord. The second one is Selah. And we need to first discuss the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is broken into two areas, scripturally. The first aspect is the reverential, worshipful fear of God. It means I love you so much, I am afraid to offend you. The second aspect is the terror and the dread of God. He's bad. He's awesome. We're dealing with somebody that's greater than you. That's why we praise. That's why we worship. You notice we don't worship each other because we are equals. You worship a superior. Does anybody acknowledge he's superior? See, when you don't praise and worship, you don't acknowledge that he is superior. Oh, but if you believe he is, somebody open your mouth and lift your voice right now and... Oh, glory, 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 glory. He is superior. And so the terror and the dread of God, and we need to just begin to discuss this because if you're going to survive this season, in fact, the Lord said the fear of the Lord is so important that it shall be that which causes us to survive the next season that is yet to come. And if you're going to make it through the end of this year, because some stuff is really getting ready to intensify, then you need to be anchored by the fear of the Lord. Now, let's open up our Bibles. We're going to go through some understandings on the fear of the Lord to allow God to speak to us. Now, remember, to be disappointed, I'm in the book of Proverbs right now, chapter 19 of the book of Proverbs, verse 23. Proverbs 19 and 23. To be disappointed means you are not satisfied. If you are disappointed, you don't have satisfaction. I want you to hear what the word of the Lord has to say about the fear of the Lord. And I'm going to tell you, we're going to get right down to it. A lot of us don't fear God. You can't fear God and sit in service and not open up your mouth and praise he who is superior. The fear of the Lord will warrant certain reactions from you. Now look at Proverbs chapter 19, verse 23. The fear of the Lord tendeth to life, and he that hath it, it who? Fear of the Lord. What? Shall abide satisfied. Now, now I want you to see this. When you fear God, you won't have satisfaction momentarily. You will be, you will abide in a state of being satisfied, which means you will not be disappointed. Even when things come along and try to disappoint you, this is why the, if you look at the second half of this, which is absolutely mind-blowing, he shall not be visited with evil. God says, when you fear me, what was meant to be evil against you, what was meant to disappoint you and hurt you and wreck your marriage and wreck your relationship and wreck your finances, I will turn it for your good. It came out as ugly, but when I touched it, it became beautiful. I need to deal with the fear of the Lord here. I need to deal with the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is in, in levels. Someone says, well, I do fear God. Well, let me, let me show you what's happening to us. 
Let's go to the book of 2 Kings chapter 17. 2 Kings chapter 17. I, I've got to discuss this about the fear of the Lord. Because God said, I'm going to raise up a people that will fear me. And you will know they fear me because you will see the attributes of the word of the Lord associated with the fear of the Lord in their lives. For if you fear me, you will praise me. You will worship me. And you will submit your will to me. Nobody's got to tell you to open up your mouth. Nobody's got to tell you to give me glory. Nobody's got to tell you to praise me. You're just going to praise me because somebody say he's worthy. Now look at this, 2 Kings chapter 17. Let's start at verse 25. 2 Kings 17 verse 25. And so it was at the beginning of their dwelling there, this is God dealing with the children of Israel, that they feared not the Lord. Therefore, the Lord sent lions among them, Not fearing God will kill you. You say, well, how is that? Because you see, you have to understand, when you fear him, you will follow him. When you don't fear him enough, you will challenge him. You will challenge him by your attitude and you will challenge him by your actions. When you challenge him, it becomes your God against his God. He being God, he takes the challenge. And you might not live through it. I want you to see this in 2 Kings 17 because this is where a lot of us are living right now. Verse 41. Verse 41. Now listen to this. So, they, so these nations feared the Lord and served their graven images. <laughs> now, that sounds like such a contradiction. How can you fear God and serve other gods? Well, what helps, is, when you get a little deeper understanding, one version simply puts it this way. So they vainly feared the Lord. You know what happens to a lot of us? You say you fear God, but you have other gods. And it's demonstrated by actions. Because whoever you serve is who you worship. Because the word worship comes from the English word worth. It's where you set your value. And what happens to a lot of you is you value your opinions and your moods and your feelings and your personal identity more than God. And so God said, you can't really fear me and have all these other gods set up. If you fear me, you're going to have to bow. Say amen, somebody. You have to begin to bow to the one true God. Now, let's get deeper into this fear of the Lord because the fear of the Lord does so many things for us. The fear of the Lord brings us into so many actions. Let me just show you some things about the fear of the Lord. Let's go to the book of Proverbs. Actually, before we go to Proverbs, let's go to Malachi chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4 and in verse 2. We're just going to get into a Bible study tonight, some on this fear of the Lord. Malachi chapter 4 verse 2. There is, I have never, I have never seen one thing do so much. There's almost over a hundred scriptures alone just in the Old Testament on the fear of the Lord. Now let's explain this fear of the Lord because you say, well, I do fear God. Listen, you can have math on the fifth grade level. You can get math on high school, university level. Fifth grade level math cannot get you a job. You can't say you haven't had math, but it is not a deep enough level to get you what you need. You need your high school, university level. That's the way it is with some of us. You have fifth grade level of fear of the Lord. You have it, but you don't have enough of it to get you the promises about the fear of the Lord that are written. You need a deeper level of it. Because if you fear God, you can't sit in his presence and just pick your fingernails. something about the fear of the Lord that makes you reach for God. There's something about the fear of the Lord that makes you open up your mouth and pursue God. There's something about the fear of the Lord that makes you only concerned about what he thinks. Let every man be a liar, but let God be true. 
And so you may not like me, you may not view me correctly, but friend, even though I love you, it doesn't matter. There's only one that can take me to heaven. There's only one that can send me to hell. There's only one that has the power to wake me up this morning. There's only one that has me give me the strength to send me on the way. If you want to know why I fear him, it's because he is awesome. You cannot treat each other just any way and fear God. Some of you scare me. You can't just tell ministers off and claim you fear God because you think you've been wronged. You didn't call them. You didn't sanction them. Fear thou God who established the office. Even if you think you cannot respect the person. You look at the apostle or look at Amen David when he was dealing with King Saul. The man had an evil spirit from the Lord, but when he stretched forth his hands to touch the man, the Lord said, the Lord spoke, the Lord said, touch not my anointed and do my prophet no harm. How could the man be anointed and have an evil spirit? Because God said, I poured the oil on him and the office that he holds is empowered by me. How dare you put your tongue to him? sat in my hotel room and God started letting me hear some things. You know, sometimes I'll be honest with you, sometimes you don't want to hear some stuff. God let me hear some stuff that was being said in the background, background whispers against the ministry. And God said, I will uncover it. I'm going to snatch the covers off it because you don't fear God. I want you to see something about the fear of the Lord, friends. Some of you aren't receiving certain things because you don't fear him deep enough. You've been praying and asking God to do certain things for you, and it's not happening. God said, I want to explain to you why some stuff's not happening. Look at Malachi chapter 4, verse 2. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. And you shall go forth and grow up as the calves of the stall, and you shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be as ashes under the sole of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. You know why some of us are not getting healing? You need to deepen the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord heals you. I tell you, I've never seen one thing do so much. To those of you that fear me, God says, you fear my name, the son of righteousness shall arise with healing. You notice that son is S-U-N. It's not S-O-N. It's S-U-N. It means that as the sun would rise in the morning and shine down upon you, so the Lord will rise up and radiate his health down upon you because you fear him. Please don't get me wrong. I know sometimes we struggle with things and we do fear God and God says, well, you're going to have to stay there. Let me tell you something the fear of the Lord will do. The fear of the Lord will let you stay someplace where you don't want to stay. You don't want to struggle with some things and the fear of the Lord just says, stay there. And you say, yes, Lord. Do you know how to lift your hands and say, yes, Lord? Do you know how to lift your heart and say, yes, Lord? Do you understand that God's just not a Santa Claus? It's not a give me system. Prayer is just not a give me system just to get what you want. And then when you don't get what you want, you pout rather than shout. Do you understand that the, th- the thing that you're coming down to is the sovereignty of God? That even when you pray and don't seem to get what you want, do you still know how to lift your hands and say, but I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice, and I will worship you? I want you to see this. Go back with me now to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs and Psalms is filled with the fear of the Lord. You know the scriptures, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But I want you to see this now. Proverbs chapter 8. Proverbs chapter 8 and in verse 13. Dealing now with the fear of the Lord. You cannot have the fear of... I've sought the Lord for years on certain things. I have watched people climb up the star-studded steps of glory and be mightily used only to become falling stars. They fell away, whether into adultery, fornication. We oftentimes, when we teach ministers, we warn them on the three G's. Gold, glory, and girls. Or if it be the opposite, it be guys. In other words, gold stands for money, glory stands for pride, and then the girl or the guy stands for the opposite sex. These are the three prominent things that have taken down ministers over the centuries. They can't handle their lust. They can't handle their own passions. They can't handle their finances. And they can't handle their attitudes. Those three things will remove you. I don't care how gifted you are. 
So I began to, I've been seeking the Lord for years. How do you rise up and not fall? I found the answer when God began to teach me on the fear of the Lord. Look at this, Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. When I listen to a whole bunch of people make all these excuses, you make all these excuses because something happened wrong to you, and all you do is make excuses. Let me tell you something. You need another dose of the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord causes you to hate evil. It will not let you make excuses regarding evil. You hate evil. Look what it goes on to say. It hates pride and arrogance, which is excessive evil or excessive mentality and the evil way and the forward mouth do I hate. When you have the fear of the Lord, you hate pride. You hate it in yourself and you hate it in others. And when you hate pride, look at the middle, when you look at the middle letter of the word pride, it's the letter I. When you deal with pride, that's a selfishness. That's a self-centeredness. Everything is about you. Everything's about what you need. That's pride. That's self-pity. That's selfishness. That means you lack a depth of the fear of the Lord. When you get the fear of the Lord, it's no longer about you. It's all about God. And if I've got to sit here and do without and not have what I want to have, as long as God is glorified, to God be the glory for great things he has done. God did not save me to make me comfortable. He saved me to make me right. I want to show you something else. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 14. Proverbs chapter 4. This thing's in my spirit. I just, just all these scriptures just in my spirit because I've been praying the fear of the Lord. And I want to tell you something. When you really get down to the fear of the Lord, friend, it'll start peeling off layers off of you. We need to deepen the fear of the Lord because you cannot come into his house and just have lock jaw and claim you fear him. You can't just come and let me tell you what the fear of the Lord will do. It will begin to lock in your mind. It will lock in your mentality. It will help your mind to stop wandering because what you begin to understand is when I fear you, I really don't care about nothing else. Listen, folk can have all kinds of opinions and what's happening to some of you is you're afraid of man. You're more afraid of your peers than you are of God. You are more afraid of your friends and what they think of you and how they view you than you are of God. You are more afraid of your parents than you are of God. Let me tell you something. There is only one that is, oh, Mike. Oh, my God. Woo! All right, all right, I, go, I can move my shot to the Baosha. I want you to understand the fear of the Lord. God's getting ready to raise up an army because you know I don't know why God said it's important for you to fear him. Because in the next season, when the day of showing starts to happen, when God begins to bring ministries out of the wilderness. Dr. Cobb, stand up. Here's a ministry that's getting ready to come out of the wilderness. Here's a ministry that God's getting ready to unleash. This is a ministry that Calvary Temple does not just belong to you, but God's going to send out. Sister Cobb, stand up. There's a ministry that does not just belong to Calvary Temple that God is going to send out. Hey! There is a day of showing, and there's coming a peeling back and an opening forth of the matrix of the womb of God that will release. The fear of the Lord is what's going to bring this to bed. That's why God can't elevate some of you. He can't. He can't. He can't. He'd love to. But you're too much into what you want. If you can't get your woman, if you can't have your man, if you can't have what you want, and then you want to try to justify it. You want to try to justify your methods before God. Oh, you don't fear God. Before I get to Proverbs, I, got to, I, got to, I hear the Spirit of the Lord saying, I've got to explain some things. Go with me to the book of Daniel, chapter 5. Daniel, chapter 5. And if the Lord says, we'll get back to some of this in Proverbs, but look at Daniel, chapter 5. God said, I, I, we, we need an increase of the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord will make you harness your mouth. The fear of the Lord will harness the way you talk and the way you treat others. Hallelujah. For how do you love God and hurt his image, which man is, which mankind is his image? Look at this in Daniel chapter 5. The story is simplistic. Abraham, Daniel has been called in 
Belshazzar has seen a handwriting on the wall. He's been called in to interpret this. He starts by telling Belshazzar about his father. Some theologians say it was his grandfather. Listen, verse 18. O thou king, the most high God, God gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor. And for the majesty that he gave him, all people, nations, languages, trembled, feared before him, whom he would slew, whom and whom he would keep alive, whom he would set up and whom he would put down. In other words, God gave him power to establish what he wanted. Watch this. But when his heart was lifted up and his mind was hardened. Do you see the, the process? When pride lifts up the heart, the mind becomes hardened. Which means reasoning. You cannot reason with the individual for they always justify. When the heart became hardened, or when the heart became lifted up, the mind became hardened and he was deposed from his kingly throne and they took his glory from him and he was driven from the sons of men and his heart was made like the beast the latter portion of the verse he said till he knew that the most high god ruled in the kingdom of men and that he appointed over it whomsoever he will pastor pasley has this position because god gave it to him and woe be to anybody that challenges it. Some of you think, oh, I could do a better job than he does. <laughs> whoa, back up, whoa. If you could have done a better job, God would, have God would have chosen you. What you're telling God is he didn't choose right. Where's your fear? When God chooses you for a position and says, do this, and then you start, but God, this person can do better. Oh, they sing better. Oh, they teach better. Hold on now. Are you telling God he didn't make the right choice? Where's your fear? How do you get in the face of the Almighty? How does the potter tell the clay? Or how does the clay tell the potter, what makest thou? What have you done? Why have you put me here? Is it not the potter that makes the sovereign choice what to make the clay and how to use the clay? Whew. Somebody just wave your hands at God right now. Open up your mouth and give him some praise. Oh God. Somebody feel the Lord. Somebody feel the Lord. Somebody open up your mouth and feel the Lord. Somebody open up your mouth and give him praise. Feel the Lord. My God, my God, my God. Look at verse 22. We're still in Daniel 5. And thou, his son, El Belshazzar, has not humbled thy heart, though thou knewest all this, but thou hast lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven. And they have brought the vessels of his house before thee, thou and thy lords, thy wives, and thy concubines, and have drunk the wine in them. And thou hast praised the gods of silver and the god of brass, iron, wood, and stone, which see not, nor hear, nor know. Now listen to this. And the God in whose hand thy breath is, and whose are all thy ways, has thou not glorified. Everybody stick out your hand. Breath is in your hand. It's called air. Now squeeze your hand. Now there's virtually no air in it. God said, your breath sits in my hands. If I squeeze now now you understand when I say let everything that has let everything that has my breath give it back to me in the form of praise hallelujah 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 the God who holds your breath in the palm of his hands. The God who owns all of your ways. God needs to make some of you parents understand he owns your children. You, you provided the DNA, you provided the blood, but God stepped up and breathed into the child's lungs. 
And if the God did not breathe into the child's lungs, the baby is born still. But God blew breath. God must always be the third party involved for life to come forth. And God stepped in. You've got to understand that when God, the reason why you live is because when God stepped up to the plate, he breathed on one hand and pushed back with the other. He breathed breath in you on one hand and pushed back death with the other hand. And so you live. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now he says unto you, if you acknowledge that I am the giver of your life, then give me praise. Yeah. 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 Woo! Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I acknowledge you. Look, 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 look. Go with me to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 51. Isaiah chapter 51. I want to come to the flip side dealing with the fear of the Lord, which deals with the fear of man. I need to say this. I'm in Isaiah chapter 51. I'm starting at verse 12. Now, I need to say this. The more you fear God is the less you will fear man or anything else. And the less you fear God is the more you will fear man and anything else. Some of you are afraid to go on planes. You know what will help you? Increase the fear of the Lord. You know why? Because when I increase the fear of the Lord, I know God holds my breath in the palm of his hand. So that pilot doesn't hold it. If you think that I am comfortable with Delta, you're crazy. Delta is what I normally fly in here. I don't trust Delta. I trust he who holds my breath. Man, I've been on some airplanes where people were, sh I mean, the whole thing was shaking like it was a toy, like some Tonka toy, and people, grown folks, start screaming. The plane drops and feels like it's going down, and the devil starts talking. <laughs> See you later, sayonara. <laughs> well, how do you not be afraid? <laughs> you don't hold my life. My life is in his hands. Hallelujah. And he hasn't said time to check out yet. You don't understand. I'm not preaching something to you that's just cliche. I'm preaching something I've had to live. You know what I've had to do at moments like that? God, I'm on board. Pick back up my pillow, go back to sleep. That's it. Huh? Sometimes you step off these planes, you start driving a car, people start driving you. The next you know, all these cars are coming right at you. Everybody seems like they, that you've got a big target on you. Everybody wants to kill you today. You can't do it. My life. I've had times, I've had times when all of a sudden in the middle of the night I'll be awakened and spiritual forces start to attack and I will literally feel the devil come right at my body and feel sickness enter into my body. And the devil goes, you're not ministering tomorrow. I go, that'd be cool if you were God then you could have that kind of say, but I don't think so. You don't got that kind of say. My life! You see, so you're too afraid of your enemy. There's only one God, one creator. There's only one that sits high and looks low. There's only one that says I'm the door. There's one that says I'm the way. There's one that says I'm the truth. There's one that says I'm the light. And my life is in his hands. Somebody shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. My God. Look at Isaiah chapter 51, verse 12. I've just got a few more things to get into regarding the fear of the Lord because God said he wants you to understand this tonight. And I've got to come from the flip side now. Listen to God. God is going to directly ask you a question. Isaiah 51, verse 12. I, 
even I am he that comforteth you. This is God. God said, I'm the one that comforts you. Who are you that you should be afraid of a man that shall die and of the son of man which shall be made as grass? He said, how much nerve do you have to be more afraid of someone who's going to die than somebody who lifts his hands forever, lifts his hands to the heaven and say, I live forever. <sighs> Verse 13, and forgettest the Lord thy maker that stretches forth the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth. He said, how is it that you're more afraid of your peers and their opinions? How is it you're more afraid of people and what they're going to say and their perceptions of you? And you're not afraid of one that has comforted you. You're not afraid of the one that has breathed life into you. You're not afraid of the one that's backed off death from you. How many of you know right now that you got more lives than a cat? You know there's nine times more, over and more. Than, you know you should have been dead. You know you should have been somewhere 20 times over laid in a grave. But God. God stepped up, looked death in the face, and said, not today. And now you're going to be afraid of somebody that can die. And forget. Did you hear what God said? God said, when you fear someone who can die, you forgot me. That's his words. You don't remember me. You obviously don't remember me. Some of you, God says, go and pray for that person. Me? Well, they're going to think I'm trying to be holy. You know, you know what amazes me? You never think what God's going to think. It never crosses your mind. Well, what is God going to think if I don't do this? You're more afraid of what they're thinking. You've forgotten God. I want to tell you a vow that I've made to God in the Spirit. It's over. No more of this kind of foolishness. I will not be bullied nor intimidated by the devil or his forces. Brother, if you want to fight, you've got one. Because if i got to face the devil or face God, I'll face the devil. You can get around the devil. You can rebuke the devil. He will flee. But where do you go from God? If you make your bed in hell, he's there. How do you get around God? You take some NyQuil and go to sleep. He'll treat you just like Abimelech. He hopped in his dreams and said, you touch Sarah, you're a dead man. You can't snore loud enough to get rid of him. You can't drive fast enough or get a mode of transportation to get away from him. You can take a plane and travel across the world. He's right where you left him. He'll travel with you where you're going, and he's waiting for you when you're coming. Why do you feel? God said, God said, this is why some of you are struggling. Because as soon as a doctor gives you a report and said, this is what it is, you automatically fear like you don't have a God. As soon as the mortgage company tells you no, you automatically fear like you don't have a God. Like he doesn't own the cattle on the thousand hill of the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. As soon as the university says we're not going to accept you, you act like that's the end of the world. Like you don't have a God that can open up a door. Does anybody believe there's an almighty, almighty, almighty. If you believe it, lift your hands again and give him some praise in this. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Go to the book of Leviticus. I want to show you some things. Because I want to tell you. Some stuff we're facing is just the lack of the fear of the Lord. That's just all there is to it. Because I don't know about you, but I don't know how your mom and your dad was growing up. But there was some stuff I was just afraid to do. I could have some real close friends. And they say, hey, let's do this. I'm like, my mom would kill me. Y'all be attending my funeral. 
Y'all, they'll never find out. Yeah, but if they do, I'm dead meat. I'm roadkill. So I wouldn't do it. Well, if you fear a person that's limited to a location, how about he that sees all things? How about he that knows all things? I want you to see this. Look at Leviticus chapter 19, verse 32. Leviticus chapter 19. I want to show you some of the stuff the fear of the Lord would just cause you to do. Leviticus chapter 19, verse 32. Thou shalt rise up before the hoary head and honor the face of the old man and fear. You know the fear of the Lord would cause you to treat the elderly right? The fear of the Lord, that's one thing this generation is lacking is respect for the hoary head. Did you know the, that's a lack of the fear of the Lord? I want you to see some of these things because there's some stuff that God, if he can just get us to understand, if he can just get us to see this, that some of the problems that we are truly facing is simply because we don't fear God. We don't have enough of the fear of the Lord into our lives and God needs to open us up and get us some of this fear deeper into our spirits. Would you just lift your hands again unto... Oh, God. I feel such a presence of God in this house. Come on. Let the fear of the Lord, let the fear of the Lord, let the fear Let the fear of the Lord, let the fear of the Lord. Let the fear of the Lord. Look at Leviticus chapter 25, verse 17. I want to show you something. Leviticus 25 and 17. We've got to establish some things in this house. I want to tell you something. You can't gossip about each other and run each other down and fear God. You may not agree with some things that some folk do, but friend, there's a biblical approach. You attack spirits and not people. I want you to see this. Leviticus chapter 25, verse 17. You shall not therefore oppress one another, but thou shalt fear thy God. Do you know that when you oppress each other, you don't fear God? You know when you talk about each other and run each other down, you don't fear God. You know, when your mouth becomes a cesspool and all you have is negative things always to say, you don't fear God. The fear of the Lord will bring a harnessing to that and will cause you to speak in accordance to the word of God and not accordance to your feelings. I want you to show you something else. Now jump back with me to Proverbs chapter 14. I want to, I'm not trying to make you shout and just get all happy and all excited. I want to deposit something into your spirit. I want to deposit something into your inner man because God said what's going to cause us to survive this season is the fear of the Lord. I want you to come right now to Proverbs chapter 16. Proverbs chapter 16. And I want you to see some of the things that God has to say. Excuse me, chapter 14. Chapter 14 of Proverbs, verse 26 and 27. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 26 and 27. I want to show you something I had to discover. I didn't know this until God began to teach me this. If you're having problems with low self-esteem, it's because you don't fear God enough. I want to show you the word. Look at chapter 14 of Proverbs, verse 26. In the fear of the Lord is what? Now, low self-esteem is the lack of confidence. So if you have strong confidence, you don't have low self-esteem. Look where it comes from. It comes from the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is strong confidence. And his children shall have a place of refuge. That's why God said if you want to survive this season of a storm, do you know what you need in a time of a storm? You need refuge. The fear of the Lord gives you the refuge. Now look at verse 17. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. Some of you have such a fear of failure, I'm afraid to do anything because I might fall into something or do something wrong. God said, if you will just simply fear me, I will cause you to depart from any snares or any traps of death. Work on the right fear. 
I guess I need to just show you a few other things before we close. Look at this. Go to Psalms 34. Psalms 34, verse 7, verse 9, verse 11. Psalms 34, verses 7. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth. If you fear him, angels surround you. And they don't just surround you to have a party. They surround you to deliver you. Look what he says in verse 9. Oh, fear the Lord, ye his saints, for there is no want. No, that word want means lack. You will lack nothing if you fear me. Look what he says, verse 11. Come ye children, hearken unto me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. You must be taught the fear of the Lord. Turn to Psalms 25. Hear what he has to say here. Psalms 25. If you need direction, it's tied up in the fear of the Lord. Psalms 25, verse 12. Some of you right now, you are in great need of direction. You need for God to direct your path, show you what next to do. You know what you need to do? Very simple, friend. Start praying for an increase of the fear of the Lord. You know why? Because God knows if he directs some of you, and if your flesh is not submitted, you're just going to disobey and tell God you can't do it. Look at Psalms 25, verse 12. What man is he that feareth the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. When you fear God, God said, I'll teach you what to do. Look what he said in verse 13. His soul shall dwell at ease. You know what happens to a lot of you, a lot of anxious? Do you know why a lot of you keep getting worried and anxious? You don't fear God enough. What are you worried about? Why are you acting like you don't have a God? Do you understand the Bible says that when you fear God, your soul comes into an ease. That ease means a prosperity, a bountifulness. There is a relaxation because I, my God, is holding me up. I don't have any reason to fear. I don't have any reason to worry. No wonder the psalmist said when he said, the Lord is on my side, I shall not fear. What can man do unto me? No wonder David said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Now look what he said in verse 13. His soul shall dwell at ease. His seed shall inherit the earth. If you want your children to be godly, you want your children to succeed, fear the Lord and teach them to fear God. They will inherit. Listen to this. Verse 14. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear. Fear him. There are certain things you will never know. I don't care how much you come to church, how many sermons you hear. There are certain secrets that will never be made known unto you until you start to fear God. The fear of the Lord is, oh my God, the secret dwells with those that fear him. Listen to what he says. And he will show them his covenant. He will manifest to them the inner meanings of the workings of the covenant of God in covenant relationship. God said in Calvary, I'm getting ready to raise me up. Some folk, they're going to fear me. And when they fear me, they don't wait to come to church to start to praise me. They're going to praise me from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. They're going to wake up in the morning and say, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. They don't rejoice after how they feel. They don't rejoice because they got what they want. They rejoice because they fear the Lord. God said, I'm getting ready to raise me up some people so that when I get ready to use you, if I use you in prophecy or I use you in laying hands on somebody and they get healed, you are not going to take the credit. If I use you to preach a sermon and everybody falls on their face in conviction, you're not going to take the credit, but you shall lay down and fear the Lord. I've got to show one last thing. I just heard the Lord on this. Look at this on Job chapter 42. When you fear the Lord, you'll start to see the Lord. Job 42. Job 42, listen to what Job said as he's ending his trial. Verse 5 and verse 6. Job chapter 42. I've heard of thee by the hearing of the ear. Job said to God, 
but now my eye seeth thee. Wherefore I pour myself and repent in dust and ashes. That word of poor means I hate myself. This is not a negativity as in condemnation. I want you to hear me. When Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up, the next thing he saw was himself. When he saw himself, he realized that he was unclean. And he recognized what he was not. I was sharing this with the men last week in our session. That amen, when I was just a place preaching on a Sunday and the power of God just ran through the house. People were delivered. All kinds of things were happening in that house that had not happened before. God was just shaking the whole house and doing what he wanted to do. But when I got home, my friend, and people were all kinds of accolades. Oh my God, you're a prophet. Oh my God, you're this. How there's no way you could have known that. You told me stuff that nobody else knew. And all kinds of things. But I want to tell you something. And as I walked into the presence of God and began to pray... And I began to pray, oh God, thy fear upon me. The first thing that began to, I began to recognize is woe is me. For I need you. Everybody else, you got to understand. When they, everybody talked about Job, they said the patience of Job. Uh, Isaiah talked about in chapter 14, verse 14. The Bible talks about how righteous Job is. Uh, but when Job talked about himself, he said, I've seen you and I abhor myself. And I repent before you. There's something about the fear of the Lord that makes you look at yourself. And says, I need you. And the reason why I can have patience with you is because the fear of the Lord lets me see what I am not and makes me recognize if you need mercy the Bible said great is the mercy to those that fear him he said he'll pity those that fear him in Psalms 103 God said that when you fear me my mercy is upon you and then you can have mercy upon others because you recognize if God doesn't get me you won't be so hard and just cutting people up. And why aren't you doing this? And why aren't you doing that right? You fear God. You won't impress your neighbor. You won't do wrong towards each and each other. But you're going to lift your hands and open up your mouth and say, God, I love you. And I fear you. And I want you. And I'm making up in my mind because this is what is coming down to Calvary. God said, let me put it right down to a nutshell. God's going to find folk where it's not about you. He's going to find people where prayer is not just some Christmas give me system. And all you want God to do is just write a blank check. God's going to find folk that want his will at all costs where that's just not some saying you got hanging up on your wall collecting dust but it's something that's coming from your spirit whatever it takes to get the will of God no matter how many tears no matter how much loneliness no matter how many misunderstandings I love you and I proclaim it's worth it is there anybody that can say it's worth it is there anybody that can tell God it's it's worth every tear. You hear me now? It's worth every misunderstanding. It's worth every loneliness. Hey, it's worth all the times I don't understand. Can I preach out of my spirit to you? Yes, there's times that I've had since the walk of those times that I've had where I've laid on the couch or laid in a hotel room and cried and said, oh God, why you've used me to minister to others, what about me? But I want to tell you something, my friend. In the midst of all the struggles, in the midst of all the loneliness, there was a God that stood up and said, I'll leave never I'll never leave you nor forsake you for I am with you always and I can look back at God and say it's worth it worth the loneliness worth the struggles worth it somebody clap your hands and shout hallelujah who shut the number who shut the number who shut the number Brother Sizemore, come with you in the presence of Jehovah God Almighty, Prince of Peace. Troubles vanish, hearts are mended. Very softly. Listen, there's some of you that are hurting. The fear of the Lord will heal you. I want to tell you what we've been doing. We've been getting the scriptures out from the Bible on the fear of the Lord, and we've just been praying them. Praying them. Increase thy fear. It changes your perspective. People say to me, how can you say certain things? You watch me call sometimes people out and sometimes the things that I have to say to them are not good. How do you do that? How does God do that? Well, God doesn't embarrass. You better read your Bible, friend. God would send prophets to kings and call them out. The apostle Paul turned and looked at the man and said, thou son of Belial and spoke the word and instantly the man was smote with blindness 
Ananias and Sapphira stepped up in the presence of the Lord and had the audacity to lie. And some of you are lying to God, telling him you're committing yourself and you'll do whatever he wants while you do what you want. And they drop dead. New Testament under grace. But tonight the Lord is reaching for those of you that are disappointed. You're hurting. He's telling you the fear of the Lord is your answer, but he's also telling you that he wants to heal you. Friend, there's some of you that are even in the ministry, you're disappointed. You don't know why certain things haven't worked out certain ways. Why hasn't God brought certain changes? I thought God was going to answer prayers. You know, sometimes God doesn't answer prayer the way we think. We hear something and we think, well, God's going to do it this way. Sometimes he just doesn't do it. I'll never forget a prophet friend of mine called me up needing words of encouragement. They said, I walked up to one of the sisters of our church, actually was the pastor's wife. Their daughter had been he ran away and had been missing for years. And then she said, under the unction of the Spirit of the Lord, I told my pastor's wife in front of others that the Lord said, your daughter's coming home. But receive her in the way that she comes. Well, everybody got all excited. A week later, her daughter came home in a box. People were baffled, but I thought she said, God said she was coming home. She did. But he also told you to receive her the way she's coming home. Well, they automatically assumed what that meant. Rather than asking God what it meant. I want you to hear me because this altar is being opened right now. Would you stand to your feet with me? There's some of you that need to come up here. You need healing from disappointment. Singers, we need you to come. You need healing from disappointment. You may not understand the way God answers certain prayers in your life. You may be still struggling financially and you're wondering. Maybe you're dealing with some of the other storms. Maybe you're dealing with the storms of relationship. Maybe you're dealing with the storms of finances. Maybe you're dealing with storms in your physical body. And you just plainly need for God to minister to you. Come on, come on, come on. Come on. Come on. Some of you couples need to, you, husbands, why you need to grab each other by the hand and say, come on, honey. The Lord's talking to us. We're having trouble in relationships. Don't you worry about nobody else. The devil says, well, oh, what, what are people going to think? Don't you worry about what nobody else is going to think. You get what you need from God. Who art thou that thou should fear as a man? Come on, there's still some more. There's still some more. If you all could right here in this aisle, if y'all could just come on up in here, please, so that more people can come. If you could just come on in here, please, so that more people can come. Thank you. Thank you. Who art thou that thou should fear as the man? Yes, yes. It's in the presence. In the presence, in the presence of Jehovah, of Jehovah. God Almighty, God Almighty, Prince of Peace. Troubles, troubles, mend. hearts are mended. Hearts are mended. It's in the presence. In the presence of the King. Oh, sing that again. In the presence. In the presence. In the.
Just keep playing that softly, singers, wait. Come on, the presence of God is here to minister to you. He inhabits your praise. He inhabits your praise. He inhabits your praise. He inhabits your praise. That's it. Those of you at the altar, open up your mouth. Open up your mouth. He inhabits your praise. He inhabits your praise. He inhabits your Come on, the presence of God is ministering right now in this house. Sing that again in the presence. In the presence of Jehovah, God Almighty, Prince of Peace, Come on all over this house right now. Just lift your hands and open up your mouth. The presence of God is ministering all over this house. All you got to do is open up your mouth, friend. Come on, that's it. Create the environment. Sterilize the atmosphere by your praise, by your worship, so that he can operate. Yes, 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 yes. Come on, the presence of God is still ministering. But friend, you got to open up your mouth. Come on. If you just stand there or sit there with your mouth closed, come on. You need to open your mouth. Do that again. Praise God. No music. No music. Just the drums. Come on. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Come on. Praise Him. Do that again. No music. No music. Just the drums. Come on. Praise God. Come on. Lift your voice. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. God. Oh, shut up, Baba Hata. Yeko Tolabo Hoshata. Praise Him. Woo! My God. Come on, everybody. Praise God. Oh! He tell a babo shut a babo shut up. He let a yonder a babo shunder a babo shut a babo.
Oh. Amazing grace. Come on, everybody, lift your hands and sing it. Amazing grace. Amazing grace. How sweet. The power of God is in this house. The sound that saved a wretch. Like Hallelujah. Me. Oh, oh I, I was, was lost, but now, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now through many dangers, toils, and snares. I see Come on, through many dangers, toils, and snares. Through many dangers. Oils and snakes. I have already come. I have already come. Oh, Tis grace. Tis grace. Woo! That's that me. brought me safe. Me safe. Thus far. And grace. And grace. Very softly, very softly, very softly. Listen, the presence of God is in this house right now. I want all of you that can stand with me in the pew. Those of you that can, please stand with me in the pew. Those of you at the altar, just you stay seated. It's all right. If you're praying at the altar, that's fine. I'm dealing with those of you in the pew. If you can stand with me. The presence of the Lord is here. And he's ministering and he's touching people right now. He loves you. He's not forsaken you. He's not far from you. And even though there may be things you don't understand and you don't like, and you don't know why, you might have a lot of questions that are very unanswered and may seem like they never get an answer. God is right here. And His arms are open so wide to you right now. And as you lift up your hands to God right now, God is reaching back and hugging you. And would you just release some praise right out of your mouth right now as the presence of the Lord. Oh God, I thank you for the comfort. I, oh, shamamaha, shatalababa, shatalababa. That's it, come on. That's it, come on. Yeah, 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 yeah. If you don't know it that well, it's okay. Just do I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice. Would you just reach out and grab the hand of somebody beside you right now because the Holy Ghost is getting ready to minister in this house. You say, why do I need to grab somebody's hand right now? Because there are people all around you that are feeling alone. There are people all around you that feel like they're by themselves. And God's letting you know you're not by yourself. I am with you. And even when you leave here, you might go to a house by yourself. I am with you. Real soft, real soft, real soft. Just whisper that song to the Lord right now. Just whisper, just whisper, I love you. And I lift my That's it, that's it. Yes, 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 yes. To Tell him, tell him, tell him, take joy. Real soft, real soft, real soft, real soft. In what you hear, let it be a sweet, let it be a sweet, sweet.
tell him this part again say take joy my king real soft in what you hear take joy my king oh my god in what you hear Woo. and let it be let it be a sweet sweet sound to your ears. do that again do that again just real soft real soft just tell him take joy my king take joy my king in what you hear and let it be let it be a sweet 